quick while you get us started a little bit. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the June 8th, 2022 Conservation Commission meeting for the town of Amherst. Um, the first item on our agenda is comments from the chair. That's me. Um, I usually just like to go over the agenda. Uh, we have um, two hearings on the agenda, but one of them will be a continuance to the June 22nd meeting. So hopefully, aside from a few other business, <clears throat> excuse me, updates from Aaron, um, we can spend the bulk of this meeting focused on continued um, review of the proposed amendments to the bylaw. Um, and the other heads up is just that we, it sounds like we have five new hearings incoming for the next meeting. Um, so we're really trying to get through the bulk of the discussion of the bylaws and public comments on bylaws tonight so that hopefully um, we can have the bulk of that through so we can deal with these upcoming hearings um, starting at the end of this month. The other small update, and I think we can discuss this later, is that we might <clears throat> want to consider another special meeting for either the week of the 15th of June or the week of the 27th of June just because we have so much on the agenda um, and there are a few things that we need to keep moving. So we'll come back to it at some point. I know Aaron added it to the slides. Um, so we'll come back to it as a discussion point later in the meeting, but just something to think about as we realize how many different things we have going on. Um, aside from that, I don't think I have any pressing updates. Um, I don't see Dave. Although I thought he was going to join. Is he having trouble getting in, Aaron? He's having trouble hmm. getting on, yeah. Okay. I don't see him. We have 10 people in attendance, but I don't see any Dave. Yeah, he's he's definitely having issues, and I know he's had issues in the past, too. Um, okay. Um, well, maybe what we should do is go to the Mount Pollux land use application. Um, <clears throat> quickly, we can get through that. Does that sound like a good idea, Erin? Yes, and the, the applicant was going to be here. Um, I don't see her on the attendee list. Um, if okay. anybody is in attendees for the land use application, please raise your hand. But um, if she doesn't show up, I just to let you guys know, I did have a conversation with her about some elements of the application. and. Um, I am more than happy to just give you guys a quick briefing on that, um, which is I basically informed her that we don't, you know, that it's always open to the public, that, um, sorry, uh, for some reason I'm getting some weird error messages, that it's always open to the public, that, you know, we can't reserve parking for the event and that we don't do any sort of site preparation for the event either. Um, and she was fine with everything. They said they're just planning a very low key 10 minute ceremony on the top of um, Mount Pollux. And I did recommend that they make arrangements for like a shuttle for transportation, just in case there's cars already up there. Um, but I'll open it up here in the share screen for you guys. Yeah, for some reason I can't seem to find it on the OneDrive folder, but I'm sure that's operator error. Yeah, so it's a, a wedding proposed on Mount Pollux at 6.30 on September 15th, 12 participants, five parking spots, no signage, um, nothing really special proposed. They're just kind of gathering and having a 15, 20 minute ceremony. Dave didn't have any concerns about it when I um, shared the application with him as well. I think you've hit on the, the usual sticking points. <clears throat> I don't see any problems with it. Commissioners? No, Question actually, my only ones? question I have is, um, I have, how, ha <clears throat> how has events been going up there? We get a lot of these, like a lot of people like to get married up there and I, I just never hear about it. So I'm assuming that's a good thing. So do you have any 
inside like you know we have all these events like people do these like small events and like or even on other conservation areas I, i'm assuming everything's going fine since we're not hearing about it is that true? yeah i mean i do periodically get feedback from people who do events that just say this is how it was like if they're doing something that's like a um, a sign up event or a publicly attended event where they respond back and say we had X number of participants and that it was, you know, successful, but on the whole, I don't usually hear back from people after events. So, to, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure to answer your question, other than the ones I've heard back from have not expressed any issues. And I assume that by the fact that people continue to apply for things like weddings on Mount Pollux that, you know, a lot of it is word of mouth probably. Okay, do we need a motion to approve that land use application, Erin? Yeah, that would be great. I'll make a motion to approve the um, little ceremony on say uh, September 15th, 6.30 yes. at Mount Pollux. Second that. Andre on the second. <clears throat> Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. <laughs> um, then, sorry, go ahead, Erin. I was just going to update you guys on the land use policy to give a little land use policy update. And I also talked with Dave about this. I know Jen brought this up sort of at the at the get go of the meeting, but our our next meeting on June twenty second is a very business intense meeting, um, and um, I wasn't able to get anything really meaningful assembled for the land use policy revisions for tonight to present. So we were thinking about possibly thinking about early July. Now again, it. It really depends on the business because like in the last week, we've gotten five applications. So it could be that July is going to be equally busy. Um, we had talked about scheduling a special meeting to deal with, with one particular situation. But I, when I talked to Dave about it, he said, we may want to consider um, a special meeting just to handle some of so, sort of our other business items that we can't handle during um, a regular meeting just so that we're not going um extremely late during a regular concom meeting um balance out the the load a little bit so we can talk about that more as the night goes on but i was hoping tonight to have some revisions to share with you again it was it's been a busy week so i wasn't able to do that but um we'll kick that can down the road a little bit but we should definitely think long term about um how we want to handle that yeah so that's one of the reasons we'd have a special meeting. Let's see, what time is our first hearing? 7.30. So we have 13 minutes, Erin. Do you want, mm -hmm. should we just quickly cover enforcements? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so we were able to get a restoration plan submitted for Zero Tuckerman, which is great news. And very, I'm extremely relieved that 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 happened. Um, and Jen and I had a conversation earlier today. How do we, you know, do we want to discuss it tonight? Because um, since our first hearing is being continued, and we're going to be pr primarily talking about um, the bylaw regulations tonight, we thought maybe we could handle it tonight. But we didn't think it was giving adequate time for folks to be prepared to come to the meeting tonight, particularly the applicant, the owner, the owner's representative, abutters, and so forth. So the thought was um, that we may want to handle that during a, a schedule a special meeting because we're not going to really have much time at the meeting on the 22nd to address it. And we do feel like it's something that we should be addressing, looking at, and giving feedback on in a timely manner. Yeah. So said another way, I just felt like handling the enforcement tonight didn't give everyone enough warning to be here at the meeting because since Aaron got the restoration plan on Monday, <clears throat> so it's just a tight turnaround time. But if we push it off to the next meet, the first meeting in July isn't until July 13th, that felt like too long to not be able to give them any feedback. Um, so 
that was one reason. So the land use policy and moving forward on this enforcement were the two big reasons that we would try to have a meeting either the week of June 13th or the week of the 24th or something like that, 25th. <clears throat> So with that information, Commissioner, does anyone have any feelings about this? Thoughts? Other suggestions for how we might handle it efficiently? You do something on the 5th. I'm a big if, if on the 15th. I'm actually have to be presenting to another conservation commission on the 15th. So I'm kind of. We're talking about the 15th of July. Oh, I was talking about June. June. <clears throat> yeah, June 15th or June 29th. Okay, the 29th I definitely can't do. Fifteenth, I can do. I think I'm supposed to be out of town on the fifteenth. On the fifteenth, Larry. Yes. So no Fletcher on the fifteenth, and no Larry on the fifteenth. Okay. Yeah. Um, Andre, what's your schedule look like, Michelle? I'm good for either. Okay. So am I? Okay. And I, can also be, I can do either at this point. Okay. <laughs> It sounds like Laura cannot do the 29th. Yeah, but maybe the 29th is better for others, so. The 29th might be better if, if Laura is the only one in this group who can't yeah. make it, that might be better for us to shoot for that. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, if that works, I'll go ahead and um, notify the applicant and schedule. It'll be just, um, just a special meeting to talk about Zero Tuckerman. Do you guys want to try to talk about land use policy at that meeting or do you wanna to try to push the land use policy to July? I'd like to talk about both in a special meeting personally. Okay. Just okay. I don't wanna cram it into a late meeting if possible. Yeah. That's okay. also my- I, I my agree. Instinct. Yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that sounds good to me. All right, very good. That's. <laughs> that's really good thank you guys um yeah give a time not yet, um, not yet. We'll, we'll, figure it out. we'll start the meeting at seven and it'll we'll just jump right into other business at that point um so um do you guys want to handle some other business items at the at the get-go here okay yeah sounds good okay um so the Department of Public Works um, had a, an emergency certification um, that was issued for, some, uh, they had a blocked culvert um, out on Northeast Street, North Pleasant Street. Let me get that up. Um, I think there's a photo in here of the um, sinkhole that formed under the road. Um, it was a relatively simple fix. They um, excavated out and repaired. It was a, um, a culvert coming out of the um, catch basin that had the joint had failed. So they excavated and repaired it. Um, and so that was what the emergency cert was for, relatively simple. I would just be um, hopeful that somebody would be willing to make a motion to ratify that emergency certification. I move to ratify the emergency certification issued to the Amherst Department of Public Works for culvert repair work at 902 North Pleasant Street. Can I second that? We have a second by Laura. <clears throat> Voice vote, Laura. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Andre. Aye. Fabulous. Um, so there were two requests for certificates of compliance. Um, both of them were actually outstanding. Um, and Vista Terrace, I've been working with the applicant, um, I think, ooh, wrong one. Um, I've been working with the applicant to try to resolve, to get it stable. Um, they have done a pretty decent job of that. Um, I met, this was, some of these photos are old, so it kind of shows before and after. Um, this is 
the after. Um, I was able to, if you recall, we kind of had a minor modification. We installed just a little area, a little sort of basin to handle stormwater. This was the before photos um, when they had originally approached me and I said, you guys need to give it a little time, but the, the seed has started to come in at this point. Um, these are again, before photos when it was not stable enough. Um, but we have reached a point where the grass seed is starting to germinate and it's looking pretty good. So I think at this point that we're, we're safe to, to, um, consider the emergency cert. Um, the, only other element of that um, application that I just wanted to point out was they, so they did submit stormwater. Um, we're supposed to have regular stormwater maintenance logs that are completed for the maintenance of the, any of the stormwater structures on that subdivision. Um, I did get some and they were not, um, very detailed, let's say. Um, there was a couple brief inspections that were done um, in 2021. I know that some of those were just recently put on a line. Um, so it should just be clear that, you know, we're continuing forward with ongoing conditions, so they have to continue to maintain that. But um, I do feel pretty comfortable issuing the certificate of compliance, mainly because I know Alan Weiss has been monitoring that site um, on a monthly basis, basically throughout construction. So um, I know that they're, you know, I've been getting monitoring reports, you guys have been getting monitoring reports, and I'm pretty comfortable that um, the, the work that's been done out there has been in compliance throughout the life of the permit. So um, if you guys are comfortable with that, um, my recommendation would be that we issue the certificate of compliance with the ongoing conditions that were um, outlined in the original order of conditions. Sounds good to me. I'll make that motion to um, issue the certificate of compliance for Vista Terrace, DEP number 089-0626 with the ongoing required conditions. Second. A second from Larry, I think. You hear that right? No. Um, voice vote, Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. Um, we do, we did also have a second um, request for a follow up. This was a certificate of compliance that I didn't recommend that we issue and I went out to do the inspection and I found a couple issues on the site. Um, so I wanted to just, I, I did actually email the um, contractor, but he didn't have a chance to get back to me before the meeting tonight. The first issue is there's a pile of stone that's been placed in the riverfront area, and I'm not sure what that's the purpose of that stone is. If they're planning to do some some sort of a turnaround or a parking area, or if they're using it for their garden, uh, I just like a little clarification on on what's going on with that pile that's sitting there. Um, there, there's a little bit of um, like the, it's not, the, the grass isn't super well established in this area where there was some compaction during construction, but it is mulched and seeded. So, um, and the, and the grass seed is starting to come up. So I feel a little more comfortable with that. The other issue I had on the um, inspection was, this is the catch basin that's at the base of the driveway. And they have a silt sack in there and there's also a straw waddle, but the silt sack is completely covered in, debris, rocks, um, uh, sediment, um, and then there's also like quite a bit of sediment that's piled up around the silt sock there. So um, that needs to all be cleaned up before we issue a certificate of compliance on this. So I'm just going to recommend that we table that until um, we get some further word from them that you know what this what's going on with the stone or that the stone has been removed and or um that that uh, erosion control situation has been corrected i agree with that plan aaron i think so, the, that so they can't they, they can't do a um no oh, sorry jen no nope, go ahead um they can't do it like a turnaround right like hypothetically if that piles of stone was for a turnaround 
they're not supposed to do that because of the river. Yeah, cool. no, no, Just they confirming. they they can't. They Makes they sense. have put in sort of a little trellised garden, like vegetable garden, um, at the top of the hill. To be honest, I'm not really super worried about something like that. I feel like it's kind of sure. a pretty uh pretty low impact situation, and it's pretty high up on the hill. There's a a really thickly vegetated grassed area in the riverfront and it's actually turning into a really nice meadow there so um yeah i'm not i'm not concerned about the garden either but um okay so then the only other other business item that we really um have on the agenda tonight is to issue the order of conditions for 398 and 406 northampton road this is the hearing that was closed at the last meeting um it's the UMass Five College, or actually it wasn't at the last meeting, it was two meetings ago, but they they granted us an extension. They actually requested an extension for us to not issue it um, because they had to go before the planning board and they wanted to make sure that um, if there weren't any additional modifications to the plan before we issued the order of conditions. Um, there was a reorientation of the dumpsters with the planning, the uh, planning board review, and that moved the, the dumpsters and the parking area a little bit away from the wetland boundary. So um, that actually pushed work um, a little bit further away from the, um, the resource area. So that was a good change. Um, they also added a canopy over the um, uh, bike racks and um, there was, I think, some um, additional plantings that were put in between the site and the abutters to the um, west. So relatively minor changes to the plan that didn't really impact the resource area at all. Um, so that's the update on that. And I would say if the commission's comfortable that we'd be ready to issue. I have everything drafted and ready to go. And these are my recommended conditions. OK, are you looking for a motion, Aaron? Yes. Okay, I'll make a motion um, um, to issue order of conditions for 398 and 406 Northampton Road, the EP number 089-0691 uh, with admitted conditions above. Second. Okay. <clears throat> Voice vote, Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. I'm also an aye. Thanks for keeping that moving, Erin. Absolutely. So let me see. I think that's everything. We do have some um, monitoring reports in the folder. Um, and I didn't update you guys on all of the um, site visits and things that I've been doing this week, just because I'm a little bit, um, it's been a little bit crazy and hectic, but um, I will be updating you. I'll try to give you guys a little, <laughs> at the next meeting, you're going to have more than, you, more than you want. So I'll just continue to update you as I can on what's going on. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for keeping us all moving, Erin. I know it's a lot. Um, and with that, I think we have to do our, or at least open and continue our first hearing. So let me just get the agenda up. Um, yeah, so um, this is going to be a continuance, a continuation to the next meeting because the applicant has decided to do a revision of the plan in the application. Um, so we are going to open the hearing, but we're not going to open the public comment portion of the hearing um, until the next meeting. So we're continuing the hearing to the June 22nd meeting, and at that point we will open public comment on this application. The reason for that is, one, we don't have the actual application to comment on yet, and two, the applicant had requested a continuance and so is not present at the meeting tonight. Um, but we know that there's a lot of interest in this application and we really want to hear from everyone on it. So um, if you're here tonight for um, the hearing of Berkshire Design Group on behalf of Bruce Allen and Carol Albino, apologies for any mispronunciation, for the expansion of an existing driveway and parking area and the 100 foot buffer zone to 
BVW at 51 Spalding Street. So if you're here for the 51 Spalding Street hearing, we're continuing it into the June 22nd meeting. Um, and at that point, we will be happy to discuss and take public comment when we have a complete application to consider um, and the applicant can be present at the meeting. Um, so Aaron, I should formally open it and then we should have a motion to continue, correct? Okay. Yes. Let me my sheet. sheet. <clears throat> um, so this is an NOI. Correct? Uh, this is an NOI, Aaron. Yes. Or an RDA. Okay. Um, this public meeting is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended in our Article 3.31, Wetland Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, and so I just need a motion to continue this public hearing to June 22nd at 7.55 p.m. I'll make the motion to continue the public hearing for 51 Spalding Street to June 22nd at 7.55 p.m. Second. Was that you, Michelle? Okay, that's Michelle on the second. Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Laura. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. So we're right on time for our second hearing, which is review and approve, or review and take public comment on proposed amendments to the Town of Amherst bylaw regulation promulgated by the Wetlands Protection Section under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, so this is a continuing continuation from the last meeting. I was not there because I got the flu. Um, so I've asked Aaron to kind of summarize some of the major kind of discussion points and questions that came up um, in that discussion so that I'm sure we have sufficient public input and public comment on some of the more complicated proposed amendments, um, if that's okay with everyone, uh, just to make sure we get into the details and that everyone is clear on kind of the ramifications of some of the revisions. Um, but again, major thanks to Michelle and Roy, who unfortunately isn't able to be here tonight. Um, it seems like they're in great shape and are a massive improvement. Just talking through some of it with Aaron, it seems like these bylaw revisions will will avoid some of the stickiest situations we find ourselves in. So I'm really glad that we're doing this. Um, so thank you for time spent. Um, so Aaron, how do you want to? Do you want to go through kind of? The, the questions that you wanted to get back to and provide more detail on first, and then we can have kind of any further commissioner comments or questions and then open for public comment. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, so we have we have basically this whole meeting now to handle this. And um, I think that that approach sounds good. Um, part of me is very tempted to actually flip through some of the markups to go through them. Um, I'm a little hesitant because I don't want to go through every single section and every single change and pick it apart. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there is some value in sort of um, skimming, uh, flipping through and skimming and just addressing any questions that might come up. Um, I think that the first question I just want to, I'd like to just address right off the bat um, is that at the last hearing, there was a couple comments that were raised regarding our abutter notification um, waiver that we inserted for the request for determination. And I just wanted to clarify that again for the record and, and sort of state my position on it, um, having gotten a number of public comments on it, and definitely a few came in at the last minute today. So <clears throat> under the State Wetlands Protection Act, um, abutters are not required to be notified for a request for determination. Um, so for 
and clarify, Aaron, that a request for determination is literally that a determination as to whether an applicant has to file a full notice of intent for a permit or not. So it is not a permit. It is a it's a determination on whether or not the applicant will file a permit. So Correct. it is a pre precursor to the permitting process, just to be extra clear. Yes. Yes. Um, so so under state law, if you're filing a notice of intent, you have to notify a butter and post a legal ad. But under state law, if you're filing a request for determination, you just have to have a legal ad. So it's actually just a public meeting, not a public hearing under the State Wetlands Protection Act. Under our local bylaw currently, there isn't a butter notification requirement. When we were going through the bylaw revisions, we suggested adding a waiver for the a butter notification requirement for request for determination. And the reason that we added that in was specifically because the railroad had filed a request for determination and had requested a waiver of the butter notification requirements, but we didn't have anything in our regulations that allowed us to do that. The commission granted the railroad a waiver of the butter notification requirements. And as such, I felt it was important that we add that into the regulations. At the last hearing, there was a lot of opposition to that. Members of the public felt that it was extremely important that we keep that requirement in there and or there was even a suggestion made that we make it so that it is not something that the Conservation Commission can do to grant a waiver that all applica applicants should be held to the same standard. I'm completely fine with either removing that waiver section and or inserting language that we can't grant a waiver to, um, uh, you know, basically make it so that they don't have to notify abutters. I'm comfortable with either one. Um, I do think that that's the whole reason for this public comment process is for us to take comments from the public and hear what people think about the regulations. And so I'm comfortable um, either way. But I think that that might be a good thing for us to discuss just at the start, because I know there's a lot of interest in that particular issue. And I think the public might want to hear people's feelings on it. Great. Um, Commissioner, does anyone have any feelings or instincts to share on this off the bat? Um, I, I just want to sort of bring up that um, Andre, Andre raised um, a potential um, midline solution, which was to state when we might consider a waiver, which is in the case of maybe railroads or um, utilities or I don't know, basically the impetus for us even including this was for these like very big um, and reoccurring projects like that perhaps happen on an annual basis and would involve notice notifying uh, you know hundreds of abutters so that's sort of where the idea came from um, I, don't, I just don't want to forget that that was an option that was brought up last time so thank you Andre for for suggesting it yeah um, it, I think that the way that that's that that shows is that um, if we're going to be granting such a waiver, it should be defined how and who, and instead of it appearing to be arbitrary or um, something that we kind of decide on the fly, I think it would be um, a lot better if that's all defined already so that we have some a go by and if it falls within, yes. If it doesn't fall within, then no. And then the public knows what to expect. And so does the, uh, do the uh, applicants. It's a very timely discussion because we literally just got the revised RDA for the railroad today. <laughs> and so we're gonna be faced with this question again, um, basically immediately. And, um, just wanted to make sure that you guys knew about that. <laughs> yeah, great. Larry? I'm just curious what other, oh, did, yeah, what other communities that you might have looked at have done about this issue around the state? 
Yeah, so it's Amherst is very unique in requiring a butter notification requirements for an ANRAD. Most cities and towns do not require a butter notifications for an ANRA or for, I'm sorry, not for, for an ANRA, RDA. for an RDA. Excuse me, yeah. I misspoke there for an RDA. So just to make that clear, even in other towns bylaws, they do not require a butter notices for RDA applications. So Amherst is unique. And so a using the railroad as an example, just because they, they are the kind of the key proponent where we've we're considering it for. Um, in most other cities and towns, they don't have to notify abutters for their annual operation for their um, five year um, operation and maintenance um, plans that they submit to the state. So Amherst holds those applicants to a higher standard. And again, this is a request for a determination. So this is a precursor to any kind of probing process. I'm, I'm repeating that for the benefit of the members of the public here. Um, so the reason that this is above and beyond is there is absolutely a butter notification and legal, legal ads placed for a full notice of intent, so a permit application. But in this case, Amherst is above and beyond already by having a butter notification for a a request for determination to decide if a project even needs to file a full permit application. Um, I, I just wanna also and get away from the example from the railroad and just go from just the standard homeowner who wants to do something very simple and is actually gonna come in front of the Conservation Commission to apply. Um, you know, you could have the unintended consequences of folks being like, well, this is so little and I have to do all this stuff. Well, I'm screw it. I'm just going to go do it. And maybe it actually would be a violation or turn into something like that. So there's also an unintended consequence, but also just, just the standard homeowner where it's like, just it, these, pro these processes are, aren't that easy and straightforward enough, you know, and it takes a lot for them to come up in front of us to do this stuff, which is great. And that's what we want to do. And we want to make it easy for it. And I think we do a really good job at it, but there's also that piece of it just like another another step in the process that's like because like you said everybody here it's an rda it's not a full permit for an noi so when you go if, it, if they do come in front of us for the rda and we determine that it needs an noi well then you go through all the hoops but this is that this is this we what I, I really would like to make this as easy as possible for people because we can make that determination and then we can say, hey, you know, we got some really great minds right here and we can help, you know, walk them through it. And when it comes to, if they have to do an NOI, we're here to help or Aaron, <laughs> but you know what I mean? So I just want to consider that and not just these, also these massive big projects like the railroad and Eversource or something. So just consider the smaller homeowner that's just like, what am I doing? I do think that that's a very salient point given that we're constantly you know we don't have any mechanisms for educating the public <clears throat> so often the first time people are even hearing about the conservation commission and wetland protection regulations is when they hear oh my god you have to go in front of the board but those times when people voluntarily voluntarily come talk to us about their project are some of the most cooperative and educational that we can go through in the town and the opposite of that is enforcement which is also is not good fun for anyone um, and not a fun process to be involved in. So um, I agree with what you're saying, Flesher, that having more onerous um, requirements to have somebody even just come in front of the board with a project on their residential property is something we need to consider. <clears throat> anyone else have any comments or thoughts on this? Uh, I have a, a question um, to, to what we're discussing right now. Um, so it is so are we um, discussing a potential proposal to uh, um, maybe to modify the uh, um, the bylaw requirements um, to exclude um, perhaps a uh, exclude the um, uh, single home residents or whatever uh, we would call them uh, from the requirement to uh, notify abutters on a uh, um, 
RDA. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so there's a couple routes we could go, right? We could say that a butter notification doesn't apply to residential RDA applications. We could include them in kind of any more detailed specification as to when a waiver would apply, right? So we could waive a butter notification for residential properties, for example, in the same vein as we want to have the ability to waive it for utility. Um, there's kind of two ways to go there, probably. I'm in but if we're waiving it for single family properties and we're waiving it utilities, then, <laughs> you know, at what point are we? I'm inclined to feel we should follow an intellectual waiver where we realize the circumstances involved and realize that it is not necessary under some cases and let us make the decision. Mm -hmm. So it's up to kind yep. of the discretion of the commission. Yeah, I guess you gotta, what Andre was saying, you gotta have, it's gotta be a little bit clear, you know, where, where's that threshold to, to do that? And the fact that you said no other towns are doing this is also interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, why are we making this harder on ourselves? Um, that is interesting. What, what, what's the threshold to, to say to make that intellectual determination or whatever? And so now we yeah. have to build that and put that on ourselves. To... Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple pieces like as you guys are talking this out that occur to me, and one of them is like fairness, right? Sort of like if we're asking one person to do it, but then we're waiving it for another person, is that really fair? Um, because there is a cost associated with it, and it can range anywhere from two dollars. An, per a butter to six dollars per a butter depending on what a butter notification method is used and also where we're under our regs which the town of amherst is also unique because we require a 300 foot buffer from the property boundary for a butter notices where other towns require a hundred foot buffer from the property boundary so we're including a lot more abutters in our abutter notification requirements than this than would be required by other towns so <clears throat> the cost is then increased because there's a greater buffer around the property um, and i think that's a good thing because more people know about it and if there is an issue going on with said property more people are going to be aware of it I think that a lot of the issues with the abutter notifications are people feel like they don't always read the um, legal ads in the newspaper. And I think that's why a lot of people really like the abutter notices because it gives neighbors a heads up if something's going on. So just to sort of talk out all those points, I just wanted to point those things out. Yeah, you know again, to emphasize for the benefit of members of the public who aren't navigating these situations all the time, a butter notification does happen when there's a permit, in which case we're going to like condition something that is other, would otherwise be in violation of the Wellness Protection Act. With an RDA, I can say from experience, Fletcher can you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but nine times out of 10, it's not something that would be subject to a permit anyway. So it's not like an RDA is, <laughs> is going to be a big project that is going to put the resource at risk. A lot of the time RDAs are landowners who want to hand cut and remove invasives from adjacent BBW or adjacent buffer to, to a wetland. And it's something where it's an educational opportunity to allow landowners to explain the project and allow us to help share, you know, ideas and resources for how to best protect the resource um, that they're working with. So I just want to make that point that an RDA is not, you know, putting in a new building next to a wetland. It is often kind of a much smaller, um, potentially not an impact. Uh, so it's, it's just a different category of project than an NOI. Is, is there any doubt um, about whether or not people defer from this because it's a financial hardship? Well, we're in Amherst. It's a well, that's an interesting people in It's a really interesting question, Larry. Um, I haven't actually 
run into a situation like that. I mean, I've certainly talked to a number of folks who've been like, what, I have to do this? How much does this cost? You know, like I've gotten those questions before where people are like, this is very expensive for a simple, you know, for me to put in a deck in my backyard or for me to put in a pool. I'm, you know, spending hundreds of dollars on a butter notification requirements. Legal ads are about $300 just to give you a sense. So like when somebody files an RDA, there's a $50 filing fee a $300 legal notice, and then you're notifying a butters within 300 feet of the property boundary. And that's by certified mail or certificate of mailing, which, like I said, costs between two and $6 per letter. And I mean, immediately, I think like, how are you defining cost, right? Because to me, when I hear, oh, you have to send a certified letter, I'm like, oh my God, I have to go during times when the post office is open. And that means I have to get that time off work. And I think that's like another like logistical thing that can be really tough for some people. Um, <clears throat> on, on that vein, since we are using utilities versus homeowner as an example, I'm sort of reluctant to further subsidize the railroads and utilities and you know put costs on homeowners and not utilities, even though they're often the ones that are gonna be having some greater impacts to more people. So that's just from a philosophical standpoint, I think, if we're, if we're weighing the utility railroad versus um, single family homes. Yep. Who has not yet weighed in? I don't think Laura's weighed in. I'm curious to get Laura's thoughts. I think the one thing that stands out to me is why other towns haven't done anything similar. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I think that's the, the piece that, um, you know, makes me pause a little bit. Um, I tend to agree with Fletcher's point that if you make it more onerous for people, they're not going to come to us preemptively. And um, I just, and that's what we want to encourage. So I'm just sensitive to what we incentivize. You know, we want to incent people to come to us with anything they have questions about. Um, uh, so anyways, that's, uh, I see, I see sort of, I see both sides here. Hmm. Um, so just procedurally, I see that there's a member of the public in attendance, Sarah Matthews, who has had her hand raised this whole time. Erin, do you want to wait to take public comment at the end of all of our discussion? Or do you think we should do like topically? I just know that a lot yeah. of people have wanted to weigh in on this. Yeah, I say we should give it maybe 10 or 15 more minutes if you want to take some public comment on that particular question. And then um, I think we should, if we are at an impasse with a decision and people want to give it more thought, then then that's fine. But we could move on to the sort of next um, items yeah. in the regs that we can cover to as we continue to think about it. And consider great. It. Yeah, so I think that's a great idea. I think we give it 10 minutes of public comment now. And again, like we're not gonna vote on these bylaw um, revisions tonight. This will be continued to the June 22nd hearing. So there'll be another opportunity at that at that hearing as well. Um, yeah, so with that, what I'll do is if you uh, have joined us and have a comment that is relevant to the point of discussion, which is um, a Amherst bylaw regulation possibly requiring, well, that currently requires a butter notification for RDA applications, but we are proposing to add the option that the commission can waive visa butter notification requirements for an RDA application. If you have comments or questions relative to that, that topic specifically, please raise your hand. Um, and I will allow you to talk. I'm gonna ask people lim to limit questions and comments to kind of two minutes per person, um, just so that we can keep this moving. We already have four hands raised. And I'd like to keep this to about 10 minutes just so we can, we have a lot to get through. Um, so Sarah, thank you for your patience. You should be able to talk. Yeah, I can talk now, thanks. So <clears throat> I just wanted to correct factually 
one thing you said about other towns not having the requirement to notify abutters when there's a request for determination of applicability. Shootsbury does have that requirement, so that's a neighboring town. Um, there are other neighboring towns that don't, but Shootsbury does. Number two, um, uh, and this was um, uh, some research that, that we did, I asked a law school, law school intern to do. There were no other waiver provisions that he could find in any other uh, town bylaws. So you'd be doing something different than other towns do by giving yourselves the ability to waive. That's not something that is in other bylaws, the waiver of the right to notify. Like they, they either have the application, there's either the obligation to notify abutters when there's a request for a determination of applicability or there's not a requirement, but there's no ability to waive it if there is one. And I think that that makes sense. I'd also, you know, that you don't, that you can't waive it because of what Aaron was talking about. You just, you, I think that when you set up a situation like that, you're asking for potential issues with, with people. You know, I think there's a reason that, that that's not there. Um, and then the other thing, I mean, I still, am a, I personally am a proponent of in, not changing it. I think that people, Put that in there for a reason. I think you've done a terrific job on these th these amendments generally, but I think there was, you know, I think that I feel like notice is helpful. I people don't, they just don't pay that much attention, and it it gives people more of a heads up, and I think that's good for participation. I think in a situation like the railroad, I agree with what Michelle said. You don't want to be subsidizing. The railroads also the types of things they do like with their spraying and stuff actually affects more you know area and more people so it's even sort of more important to be aware of what's going on um that's that's my opinion but but anyway i just wanted to clarify that about the other town that shootsbury has it that's helpful Thank sarah you. in that research were there towns aside from shootsbury that had a a yeah, that don't. Under, yeah, they're definitely notification requirement. that did not. No, Shootsbury is the only one that we that the guy that was doing the research for me found. So Northampton does not require it. Holyoke does not. Pelham does not, and Southampton does not. I think that's right. Okay. Uh, and, okay. Oh, it's possible Pelham also does. I don't know, you'd have to check Pelham. Sorry, I'm reading too quickly. I just remember that Shootsbury definitely does. So it's yeah. possible Pelham also does. But anyway, it's not that no towns have it. Yep, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Those sure. are all great points and great things to consider. Okay, I really thanks. appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yep. Um, okay, Janet Keller should be allowed to talk now. Thank you. Um, I also, I listened very carefully to what you all were saying. And I appreciate that you don't want to increase the burden um, or chase away someone who might otherwise come to you um, I still feel that the notice is incredibly important and the um, impacts of even some of the smaller uh, uh, changes that people then go on to make um, can, can be great. One thing I did want to say and emphasize regarding the railroads and the utilities and maybe highway departments that have so many miles uh, to maintain is that I was really struck by the impact that they have if they choose for example, a way to maintain those rights of way uh, with 
herbicides, for example, um, it's a huge impact um, on, on the resource and um, potentially even to people along the way. And um, I did a little bit of research. I uh, um, have limited time, but uh, increasingly uh, jurisdictions are looking at um, requiring less impactful um, maintenance. So first you gotta know they're gonna do it. And, and, and people along the way, um, I just feel it's terribly important and you can't be asking people to uh, look at the newspapers um, for those legal notices. Um, that that's not a way to learn about it. So um, I'm not, I'm still not seeing um, what the public benefit um, is here that outweighs um, the opportunity to weigh in on these, these um, determinations. So um, I would invite someone to um, perhaps explain uh, why one isn't, explain the difference that you're seeing that I'm not. But, um, and again, I want to emphasize that I am so um, grateful and appreciative of all the work and the high, high quality work that you've done on, on this overall um, update. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. <clears throat> I'm gonna disable your talking, but um, Fletcher, if you're still there, would you re-emphasize your point about the concern, what the concern with a butter notification for an RDA is? Oops. Yeah, sure. Um, let me just disincentivize and unintended consequences of more burden on folks with something that's most of the time, 95% of the time, it's extremely simple procedure that we get to have this opportunity to engage with these folks with about. And as we've, Aaron and Jen, have you said, if we're going past, once the RDA, if we're going to the NOI, the notice of intent, the real permit, everything's out the door we're talking about and everything goes in we're straight into a butter nose is 300 feet i didn't know that about the um the boundary lines opposed to some towns are just 100 feet so just again folks we're talking about some pretty standard things here that happens um again i'm just sticking with a kind of small landowner here um idea so i'm just afraid of the unintended consequences and disincentivizing folks to actually going to try to come in and do the right thing Thanks, Fletcher. Um, okay, the next person I have is Paige. We're getting towards my 10 minutes, so I'm really gonna ask folks to keep it to two minutes if possible. Hi. Um, like Janet, I appreciate all the work you've been doing. I have a few quick comments about the abutters notice. First of all, commenting that it's 300 feet is more than other people. I think it's essential that when it's a stream, anyone downstream should be notified. And that's gonna be a lot more than 300 feet. So I don't think 300 feet is a good thing, it's too little. Um, in terms of the cost, it seems like in this day and age, we could just email people. And if there were some way to build that into the regulation, it would be cost-free. Butters could register their emails that they wanted to be notified if there was something that came up. So that would eliminate the cost. Um, I think it's important to keep public input that people directly affected have a lot more information that will help the for better outcomes and better decisions. And I'm confused about this RDA argument. It seems circular. It sounds like you were saying that a butters would be noticed, notified if there was an RDA, but there might not be an RDA, and so butters wouldn't be notified. And I'm not, I'm not clear about what that's about. But it seems like 
it, you're almost saying that abutters might be notified if this happened, but they wouldn't be otherwise. And so there might be a way they're left out of the loop. Just to clarify that page, the RDA is a request for determination that is a precursor step to a filing of an NOI, which is a permit application. So if there's a um, project or proposed work that is not a major impact to a resource, they might submit a request for determination. And it gives the commission a chance to work with that project or applicant to make sure that the resource is protected, but that they don't have to go through the process of filing a full well, permit. If the commission we... decides that in fact, that project meets the requirements for a full permit application, at that point, what they call a notice of intent for a full permit application, they are required to do full notif a butter notification and legal ads. So it's a the RDA is a precursor to any sort of formal permit process. That's helpful, but it seems like public input might sway whether or not you determined whether or not it was required. Fair point. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, and Dorothy Pam. Hello. Uh, my question is about timing. Uh, if you don't notify a butter. Dorothy, you're breaking up a little bit. We just lost your audio. Dorothy, we can't, we can't you hear you. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Oh. It just came back. Okay. I know I'm having trouble with the internet. Um, did you hear me that my thing is it's a question of timing? You said um, it's a question of timing and then we lost you. Okay. If you don't notify people when there's a an RDA and only when somebody wants a permit or you think they need a permit, how much time does the, if the person, if an abutter is notified, how much time do they have to think, study and organize and to respond? after if you if they only hear about it when a permit is requested because people don't read legal ads and they're hard to read anyway because they're very small um so that's my question so i can i can address that um if that's helpful the yes. so um uh, legal advertisements are required to be posted a minimum of five days prior to the opening of the public hearing. A butter notices are required to be sent a minimum of seven business days prior to the public hearing opening. So that gives you a sense if an abutter is notified, they're usually notified um, right before the hearing occurs. So it, it doesn't really allow much time for um, sort of mobilization as you've described, right. like if they're right. getting a notification right before the hearing opens. Okay, so so that would suggest to me that if there is to be any meaningful public input, then you should keep it as it is and notify people if there's an RDA, even though they don't all lead to permits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I see Sarah has her hand up again. Sarah, um, one more comment, and then we got to kind of cut this one off. <laughs> Keep things moving. Oh. Uh, All right. Hi, thanks. No, I just wanted to make the point that I think that notifying people of requests of determination of applicability is really important because that's the point at which the decision is made whether or not they need a permit. So that, that's determining from a legal perspective whether the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction, has the authority to weigh in on what's the proposed thing. So I think from a legal standpoint, that's actually very crucial. And it was actually recently that I got involved with my um, sister and brother-in-law because of an Eversource request for determinant of applicability um, to spray herbicides. So I think that, you know, for people who care, you know, and it's like particularly with the uh, 
you know, things like the utilities, the way they sort of operate and have a lot of, you know, leeway in other areas. I think it's really important that, um, that people be notified. I just want to emphasize that again. And I think it is important. I understand like Sometimes in a small case with a you know single family home, it, maybe it's not so important, but there are going to be cases where that's actually the critical thing is whether the CONCOM has jurisdiction or not. Okay, fair point. Appreciated. Thank you, Sarah. All right. So. Um, how to move forward on this issue. Um, personally, I feel pretty conflicted and I think everybody has made fantastic points. Um, if the decision was just the waiver or not waiver, I think, I do not think having a waiver is a good idea because I think it will make it more complicated for us and potentially unfair to applicants, which is not the goal. Um, which we are trying to avoid. Um, but the question of whether a butter's um, need or that we need to have a butter notification for an RDA, it seems like some very salient counterpoint. Commissioners have brought up some very salient counterpoints for that. Um, commission, do we want to give Aaron any direction on this? Um, so there's point A, waiver or no waiver, point B, RDA better notification or no notification. Can we give Aaron any actual direction on either of those things um, with some amount of consensus right now? Or do we need to mull it over, think it over, read some more, do some of our own research and bring it back up in the next meeting? Yes, Aaron. sorry, what did I mess up? Oh no, you didn't miss anything. I just wanted to make a point before you guys weigh in on this, which is, <laughs> I don't think that what we're asking right now has been is broken in any way. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Like the way that things have been working has been fine. Um, I added that in basically to make it legal. So if somebody came before us, it's not like we were doing something that was going off the rails and not in our regs. Um, I think from my perspective, it would be more helpful for us to say waiver, no waiver. And or if we're saying no waiver, I think it would be very important for us to say that in the regulations that we're not waiving the abutter notification requirement. Um, and I, I feel like that should be what we're considering as opposed to wiping out the abutter notification requirement altogether. I think that there's been a lot of public support for the abutter notification requirements from neighbors and um, like I said, I, I think it's it's been similar to the Zoom meetings. It's been an opportunity for inviting public comment and public discourse, public involvement in our process. And I think that's an important thing for us to continue to do. Um, so that's just my comment as staff. I, I would be hesitant to wipe out the entire section requiring it because we have required it since 2014 or maybe even before then. Um, I think that the if the waiver is what's the hang up here that we could just either stricken that from the revisions just so that we're not hung up on it and or we could just say no waiver and just make it simple so that like across the board it's fair to everybody. So kind of, let's do a quick kind of in round robin here. Um, commissioners, would you be in support of removing the waiver provision from the abutter, for, abutter notification process within the RDA? Larry? You're on mute, Larry. You're muted, Larry, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to lean toward the idea just to go back to no waiver at all for anybody. Okay. Michelle. Mike. Mute. <laughs> um, I agree with Larry. That's where I'm at. Okay. Uh, Fletcher. Just say that again, Aaron. You said that the from 2014 this began. Well or before, I'm not entirely sure when that provision came in, but the- so the, the waiver provision came in or whenever that oh no, time. The, uh, no, the, the waiver notification. provision is new. 
the waiver provision is new. There has not been a waiver provision in the abutter for notification for the RDA until now. Right. That's so it's always been provision. it's always been a butter's notices regardless in the bylaw. Yep. Since the bylaw, right. which was before all of our time. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sure we have less headaches. So um, it's going to be the same I, headache that we've had since 2014. Right. Or th in this case, um, people applying for RDA headaches. Yeah. Um, so if we, I mean, yes, I would say get rid of the waiver because unless we have some certain threshold that puts us over that, we can't, it, it's too gray. Yeah. To say, yeah. oh, well, you're okay, but you're not. It's just, can't, we, we don't have anything there. We're not going to have anything that's fair. Yeah. Right. So in that case, get yeah. rid of the waiver. I would like to get rid of a, a butter's notices for RDAs, but if you're just asking yeah. about the waiver, get rid of the waiver. Yeah. Okay, so let's just stick to the waiver for now so we can give Aaron clear direction. So Laura, waiver, no, no waiver. I, I agree. I think I think requiring a waiver puts undue onus on us to try and you know balance like who, who gets it, who doesn't. So yes, I'm agreeing with that one. Okay, Andre. Yeah, um, I think, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I find also that, uh, that actually instituting a, a fair uh, method of, uh, of, of issuing waivers is, uh, is much too complex to, uh, for, for this right now. I, I would say, be, uh, given what we've got, um, I, would strike the waiver. Okay, so that's good. That's some clear direction for Aaron. No waiver. Okay. Um, now, I think if people are comfortable with it, we should go around again and just give a soft vote on a RDA, a butter notification or not. If you're not comfortable weighing in, you want us to take more time, say, give me till next meeting and that's totally acceptable. I, I could go. Um, I, I find this a little bit complicated. Um, uh, in the case of, uh, you know, I, I think in the case of, um, uh, you know, single family residences and if they're doing it for themselves, I think uh, it would be good to, um, to get rid of uh, the notification. Um, I, you know, I think in the in the case uh, of a large uh, of the you know of the utilities and so on, um, I I think uh, I think the uh, the public has brought out the members of the public who've spoken have uh, brought up some uh, uh, very good points, and uh, there is a, a public interest in uh, knowing um, what is being proposed, so to speak, and so I would tend toward not um, or to, tend toward uh, making them have to um, have to notify folks. So it's, it's a little bit complicated for me there. Um, okay. Okay. Um, is that, Michelle, is that the, can I ask a question, John? Is yeah. That essentially is a waiver though, right? <laughs> If we're waiving it for homeowners, but not for, I mean, that is. Yeah, so we're not, what's what's the question right now? Is, no, no, I, do we I require a butter notification? Sorry. No, I was saying what I heard Andre say was, right. well, we're against a waiver. Maybe I misheard it. Well, I heard him say he's against the waiver. I also heard him say that he is less in favor. And tell me if I'm wrong, Andre, I don't mean to mischaracterize what you're saying. He's less in favor of it for you know single family home, homeowner. Maybe I misheard it, but okay, he didn't say that. And more in favor yeah. for like utilities. And like yeah. That. So, so I changed to topics. <laughs> yeah. Just to just to clarify, um, speaking specifically about uh, uh, notifications, um, I think in that case in that case so we're not talking about a, an actual uh, waiver for uh, we're not talking about an actual uh, uh, waiver what I'm talking about is a notification to um, to the abutters Butters. and um, I find it a, a, a little bit complicated um, because uh, you know in order to um, to avoid burdening um, uh, 
folks who are just, uh, you know, the regular, regular folks who are just trying to do something in their backyard, if you would, versus um, a, a corporation that's got a big, big project. Um, I, you know, I tend toward, um, toward allowing some, and I wouldn't call it a waiver, but uh, exceptions um, to the uh, requirements. Can I, can I just okay, jump in so here? I think, I, hold on, Aaron. We got off track here. Yeah. So let's, let's regroup for a second. We just had consensus that we are not going to allow any sort of waiver from the abutter notification for an RDA. We just all agreed to that. I then switched gears and said I wanted a sense from everyone how they felt about the abutter, requ the requirement that for an RDA that you have to notify abutters. Mm -hmm. And what Andre has said is that it's complicated. You know, he can see salient points coming from all directions of that issue. It is complicated. It absolutely is. And so the point I, you know, I, the, the goal of this exercise is to get a feel for how everyone is on this so that we know where we are. We know clearly if we need more information that we can gather before the next time we discuss this. Um, and so we know if we are close to consensus and or if we need Leroy to weigh in before we can make any, any headway on this. Um, so the point was just to get a feel for how everyone feels about the requirement that you notify of butters for an RDA. Erin, did you have a, more to say? I just feel like we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole with this in the sense of like teasing it apart. And like if the requirement's been there, the bylaw review committee looked at this for four months and we didn't remove that requirement. Like I feel like that requirement, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's an extra layer of public involvement in the process that we've never really had an issue with. So. I, I'm hesitant to remove that because I feel like that would make these changes, which overall these changes have are a extreme improvement in protection to resource areas. And that if we start removing things like that, it's gonna make this a very controversial process. And that in, in um, talking about removing a butter notification requirements, it could create a lot of, um, folks being upset about that and not wanting us to change what's what we're proposing or you know what's existing so i just i'm just concerned that it's a it would be a very controversial change that the public would not be happy with if we eliminated a butter notification requirements for rdas yeah i i completely hear you and tend to agree with you that said like this is our moment to discuss this and it seems like several of our commissioners have brought up concerns about that abutter notification requirement. So I'm just trying to make sure that we have all the information we need in order to vote on that, on these bylaw, you know, revisions. Um, just, just trying to make sure that, you know, the commissioners <laughs> have a chance to, re to really weigh in. Um, but yes, I agree. We, you know, this has been a long discussion of abutter notifications for an RDA, something that you know, we don't, it's, it's, it's not measured the impact that it's having on the process. We know we don't hear about it. So we don't think it's a problem, but we also don't know how many people are considering submitting an RDA and don't because they're like, oh my God, this is a very onerous process. Um, so I think Fletcher and Laura, you guys have kind of expressed where you are with concerns for a better notification. Um, is that still kind of where you sit on this? I'm trying to make it harder on anybody, but if we don't no. let her know this is our RDA, and you want to make it complicated or not complicated, but if we're, we're talking about the complication of these utilities or something, there's another way. Is there another way we can post it? I don't know. I mean, everything's mm -hmm. on our on our website, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, all current applications and agendas are on our website. Yep. So if you don't want to read a legal ad, go to our website. I, you know, I don't know. We it's there. Um, you like, gotta find it. It's not. You got to find it. Yeah. I, I agree. I don't find anything on the. You know, it's hard. But okay, um, Laura, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Oh, well, I mean, you... I, listen. 
I hear what the public's saying. Um, we don't have, I would love to have data that we don't have. You know what I mean? When people, you know, the number of people that say, um, I want to look into something and, oh my God, this is too long. I'm just going to do it. You know, I mean, you, I'm sure it happens quite regularly in Amherst um, and in other areas too. At the same time, I also agree with a member of the public who said the people who are abutters the property have a lot of information about the site. Mm -hmm. um, whether it be a small homeowner or, um, you know, a larger corporation. So I don't know if, if it's been in place for a long time and, and there haven't been complaints about it. I don't, I don't feel compelled to change it. Um, I just, the, the comment, uh, Fletcher's comment really resonates with me in that you want to get people to feel comfortable to come in front of us, um, whether they're going to cut down a tree you know what I mean? Like something small to like extending their deck by two feet or building a stone patio, you know? Um, so um, anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely appreciate the conflicted sentiment. Michelle? Sorry, I know we all wanna move on, but um, so butter notification is defined in our regs and it's defined for the purpose, you know, of certain purposes, but I'm just curious, you know, Erin, if there is a middle ground, like, you know, if, if we are all conflicted on the extent of um, the, you know, the, the, how onerous it would be to give notification, could there be an RDA notification? Could we have a second definition for a butter notification that was RDA specific? Well, you could just require Not U.S. mail notification and not have it be a certified return receipt. I mean, that would be a lot cheaper. That's, not, that's an option. Those are options. And, uh, and there's I'd no. Add that, I'm sorry. I'd add that legally, um, something sent in the mail is considered to be uh, delivered. If it's mail, is that true? Yeah. That, yep. That's, le uh, that's a legal. So. Uh, uh, I forget what stipulation. So, so that might be a compromise is to require it just be sent through US mail. The only kind of issue with that is there's no real proof of mailing unless we have people send us photos of their um, letters that are all addressed and stamped. We're trusting them to do it. We're trying. Well, what about right. removing so that? Think, yeah. So, okay. So I think we've, um, we've kind of, circled this enough and i think we should move on for tonight um and uh, we'll we'll be sure that we get little Roy caught up on this in case he can kind of weigh in as well um since he like michelle has been um really in the in the midst of all these uh the bylaw regulations but i would just ask the people when you're spacing out doing something think about this um because we want to figure out if there's more information that we need in order to make the decision that we're clear with Aaron about it so that we can keep this moving forward. And I also wanna say thank you so much to everyone who's from the public who's joined this to talk about this. It's something that we take very seriously. Like it is the most important thing to us that we have as much public involvement in this process as possible um, because it's very important to all of us that we protect this resource as best as we possibly can. And we recognize or of including abutters and having as many voices in the process as possible. We just wanna make sure that we're not involuntarily excluding people from what is like a very, very important educational opportunity through the, the RDA process. Um, so this is, again, not something we're taking lightly. We 100% hear what everyone is saying. Um, we just, we're gonna keep, keep kind of digging into it and thinking through it. Um, so thank you for being here for all those helpful comments, both members of the public and commissioners. I really appreciate how we can discuss this. We can, you know, agree to disagree and admit when we're confused. So I really appreciate that. Um, okay, Erin, what would our next? Yeah, <laughs> and be? I do wanna just, just say something that I think is another very important point about the changes to the bylaw regulations, um, and I think it's pertinent to this conversation, 
is historically, like in our current bylaw regulations, we do not have minor activities excluded. So anybody has to file a permit for cutting a single tree, right, in a buffer zone. Right now, all of the state exemptions, well, there's only a couple exemptions that fall under our local bylaw. Under our bylaw changes that are proposed in this hearing process, we're adding those minor activities back in, we're adding those exemptions back in. So I just want to point that out because a lot of the more onerous filing requirements that have been required for single family homeowners are now being removed a little bit so that there's a little more wiggle room for single family homeowners to put in a deck if they're over 50 feet from the mean annual high water, if they're over 50 feet from the buffer, put in a deck, a, a shed, a patio, a pool. Those are things that historically they would have had to file an RDA for. And that was very strategic on my part to number one, incorporate those because right now we're dealing with, it seems like sort of a surge in permits from my perspective. And so if we're dealing with a surge of permits, like large scale development permits and things, and then we have like a large scale development for an apartment complex and a large scale development for mixed use buildings, and then we're getting a permit for a shed, it's like it feels a little bit unbalanced. And so it's the goal with these regulatory changes just in general is to sort of even out the playing field a little bit and say, okay, we're going to give single family residential folks a little bit more leeway to do some of these smaller projects. Um, but we're also doing some things to strengthen the setbacks and to um, tighten up the performance standards so that um, we reduce impacts elsewhere that might be more large scale impacts. So I just wanted to point that out because I think that it's it's important and relevant to the discussion. So another way to say that is that we're making sure that the RDAs and the permit applications that come in front of us are ones that are likely to really impact the resource. Exactly. So we're sure that the onerous hoops that we're asking people to jump through for these permit processes are really ones where the project proposed is likely to impact the resource, um, which is, that's a very good point, Erin. You know, we're tightening restrictions so that we're really going to see the projects we need to see, but we're allowing more leeway for the projects we don't need to see to move forward without going through a very onerous permit process. Is that a fair summary, Erin? <laughs> Yeah, yep. And um, so what I'd like to do um, is just touch on, so Dave had had some questions um, during the uh, previous meeting about, um, and sorry, I had this all queued up and um, I just wanna jump back really quickly. Um, there was some questions that were raised regarding um, like some of the the decision making and like some of the other towns that we um, looked at for some some of the setbacks and the fee structure and things like that. So I just want to um, talk about that really quickly um, because one of the big changes in the, these bylaw revisions is also going from currently a 25 foot to 35 foot no disturb setback depending on the type of development, right? So driveways and parking lots, you can go up to 25 feet from the resource area um, uh, and like residential can go up to 35 foot no, no disturb, but then like for, for um, commercial buildings, it's like 75 foot setback, right? So um, the proposal right now is to just make it an across the board 50 foot no disturb um, setback. So that is a that is a pretty dramatic change from our existing regulations to the proposed. And I did look at a number of communities and like the, the two number one communities, the number one and number two communities that I looked at were Northampton and South Hadley. And part of the reason for that was because those are communities to me that are most comparable to Amherst in the sense of like college presence, development pressure, high population. Um, 
but I also did look at a number of other communities just to see what their setbacks look like. So like, for example, East Hampton or Granby or Leverett, they don't have any um, no disturb setbacks, right? Um, there are communities who have bylaw regulations like Pelham who also don't have any um, minimum setback. Uh, Shootsbury is another one, doesn't have any minimum setback. But then you look at a town like Sunderland, Sunderland has, excuse me, a 50 foot um, no disturb. And then a community like Hadley, Hadley has a 35 foot, Belchertown has a 25 foot. So Dave had asked sort of just to give a rundown of what is happening in other communities, what other community regulations look like. And so that's what this um, is meant to to show you guys and give you a sense of, do you agree with those changes that we've brought forward with a 50 foot no disturb or do you think that's a little too much? Do you think we should scale it back a little bit? Erin, just a quick clarifying question. Um, when you say in the wetland setback, like for example, East Hampton, you say Wetland Protection Act, what does that mean? So what is the default if there's no bylaw change? Right, so what that means is that, um, the no disturb is actually a um it's spelled out in the bylaw regulations as being um a restriction that the conservation commission has to enforce so um towns like northampton and south hadley they have this 50 foot no disturb like we have a 35 foot no disturb um a community like east hampton they would theoretically let people work right up to the edge of a wetland and there's no sort of um, vegetated buffer that they require in between a work area and a wetland. Thank you. So the 50 foot across the board, no disturb setback would bring us to the most stringent end of the spec, the local kind of spectrum in terms of no disturb bylaw setbacks. Um, just kind of, is that a fair summary you would say in this research? Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's making us it's, it's adding a little bit of additional protection to the wetlands. And my observation is, and, you know, Jen and I had a conversation about this earlier today is most of the upland area in the town of Amherst has either been developed or protected. And so what we're dealing with a lot of the times are these properties that have wetlands on them. And, and a lot of times they might be sandwiched between two other properties in an urban area. Um, these, this is guidance for the commission. And again, there, there, are, there is still a provision for replication. So people could still come before us with a proposal to fill a wetland. People could still come before us with an, a proposal to encroach closer than 50 feet, and the Commission can review that on a case by case basis. There may be situations in highly urbanized areas or areas where there's a really severely degraded wetland where there's an opportunity for mitigation and so the Commission could theoretically balance whatever is proposed for development against whatever mitigation is proposed to improve the resource area or um, gain some net benefit from whatever is being proposed. But this is just sort of like a, and, and in my opinion, this, this evens the playing field as well, because there's like, this is allowed to encroach 25 feet. This is encro allowed to encroach 35 feet. This is allowed to encroach 50 feet. This is allowed to encroach 75 feet. It's confusing. And, and I think a big part of what the bylaw review committee was looking at this and saying, let's simplify this and make this easier for people to understand and like, like just more straightforward in terms of what people can expect and, you know, people who are proposing development in town to understand our regulations a little more clearly. Thanks, Erin. Commissioner, does anyone have any questions on about this research that Erin just, either the revision or this research that Erin just shared? some shaking hands. Okay. From my perspective, I think this is the right thing to do, both for clarity, but also because often with our existing 25 to 35 foot no disturb, it ends up being that kind of the project limit is at 25 to 30 feet, but then there tends to be other activity happening <laughs> inside of that no disturb area, whether it's temporary or permanent. Um, and to me, 
once you get within 25 feet of a wetland, there's no question that there's an impact. And so um, I think that the 50 foot no disturb um, is a better mean disturbance line, understanding that no matter what we do, there's kind of variation around that, that mean. Um, that also makes sense for me from like a scientific standpoint in terms of stormwater management um, for a setback. So I personally am comfortable with it and think it's the right thing to do. Um, Commissioner, does anyone have any concerns? Looks like a happy, but maybe tired, potentially burnt out crew. <laughs> Uh, you, guys um, made, you guys made great points. I mean, one, the town is built out. That's pretty straightforward. Um, and so everything's degraded in some, some ways, unless it's protected. So, and like you said, Aaron, people are still going to come in front of us to see for mitigation or whatever. That's still going to, it's not, there's going to be some, yeah, some smart, smart engineers coming in front of us to figure a way around it. So use the 50 foot. Yeah, and I mean, if we can if we can get resource area improvement out of a greater encroachment, then I see that as a net gain. Um, if there's some issue that needs to be cleaned up, some um, you know invasive species issue that needs to be addressed, I feel like we can we can use that as leverage to allow encroachment where it could be considered to be more appropriate. Um, but you know, that's just a, a more solid line. There is one other change that I want to point out because it's it's a pretty significant change. Um, and this was modeled after the Northampton um, bylaw regulations, which is that um, uh, I included in there that in the area on a given lot, the area between 50 and 100 feet, that there would be a limit of 20% alteration of that buffer zone on a given parcel. So that's another. And again, it's it's a discretionary it's guidance and it's if they're in a highly urbanized area there they may be permitted to alter more than that if they're you know um, in a rural area then the commission may stick to 20 percent but it it provides them sort of some guidance that we really don't want to see like the entire buffer zone outside of 50 foot clear cut if we can avoid that we'd like to try to sort of concentrate things and limit impact as much as possible the other thing i really like about that for my two cents is I like the quantitative angle because a lot of the time when we see these permits, the first question I'm asking is, what's the square footage inside XX buffer? What's the percentage of total? And so what that does is drive an applicant towards actually quantifying the impact, which will prevent, will actually help everyone because it's going to keep these, these applications moving more quickly rather than opening it one here and continuing to the next. Like it'll help people to have the information we need to make a decision be more likely to have the information we need to make decision when we open the hearing. Um, did anyone have any questions about that revision or? I just had a question, Erin, where did that come from? Did you see that in a neighboring community or? It was in Northampton, the city of Northampton had it. And I really, I really like the Northampton bylaw, um, the bylaw regulations in Northampton, because I feel like they, are, are a little more stringent than Amherst, but they also provide a little more flexibility in urban areas. And that was something that the bylaw review committee spent a lot of time discussing because when we were discussing that specific condition, the thought was, well, in Northampton, they specify in specific zoning districts, they allow closer encroachment. So if it's um, a downtown district, for example, they may, may allow encroachment to 35 feet or to 10 feet or something mm -hmm. like that. And we looked at the zoning in Amherst to see like, would we feel comfortable um, adjusting our sort of our setbacks based on zoning district. But Amherst and Northampton are different enough in our sort of zoning layout that it didn't fully make sense to do sort of like an apples to apples um, uh, comparison with them on that. but. I did really like the 20% limit because I feel like that um, gives us a little more, you know, leverage for mitigation or leverage for um, uh, protection, perform, um, re resource area improvements. 
That's great. Yeah, thanks, Erin. So I'm keeping an eye on the clock and we still I still would like to have like a period of for open public comment. Were there any other big ticket kind of revisions that you wanted to go into detail on in this hearing or this thing? Um gosh, there's so many big ticket things with these, with these. I mean, there there's a lot of changes here. Um, but I would just like to really quickly state that. Um, you know, Leroy did a really good job at the last meeting. And so if anybody wants to sort of get a refresh on what the overall changes are, that that would be a good place to do it. But um, I just just sort of bulleted points really quickly before we jump to public comment is we included minor activities. We included state exemptions, which should have been included all along really in our bylaw. Um, we made our definitions consistent with DEP definitions. So if there were any definitions that were duplicate under our regulations that were also defined under the Wetland Protection Act, we removed those. We referenced, we follow all of the DEP Wetland Protection Act definitions. Here are our additional definitions that we define under our local bylaw regs. Um, for resource areas, riverfront was not included in our resource areas we included Riverfront. Riverfront is now a resource area under our local bylaw regulations. Um, there were issues with specific resource areas where sort of the general framework of Wetland Protection Act versus our bylaw regs is that there were performance standards that were pulled from the Wetland Protection Act and plugged into our, our regulations. And then there were more stringent sort of at the bottom. So the top few were borrowed from the state and then our more stringent ones were at the bottom. The problem was it was like as if somebody had picked and chosen which ones to take from the Wetland Protection Act and include in our bylaw. Now all of the performance standards under the Wetland Protection Act are in our bylaw and our more stringent ones are also listed. So it's apples to apples to the Wetland Protection Act. Um, vernal pools, we clarified because there was a problem with our vernal pool definition and there was a problem with vernal pools being a subset of bordering land subject to flooding. Also under the um, resource areas, <laughs> um, bordering vegetated wetland and um, isolated vegetated wetland were combined together under our bylaw regulations. They are separate in the Wetland Protection Act. We separated those for consistency. Likewise, under our regulations, bordering land subject to flooding and isolated land subject to flooding were separated under our regulations. They are now combined so that they are apples to apples with the Wetland Protection Act. So, um, and then, and then um, we made it clear under isolated, um, vegetated wetlands that it's there are iso isolated vegetated wetlands and there are vernal pools both of them are protected under our bylaw and they are defined separately and we used we separated out vernal pools so that there are physical criteria and there's biological criteria now listed so it gives people a lot more guidance there's no confusion over does our bylaw cover what's under the state um that is a canned, very quick overview of some of the changes. There are a lot more. Um, I encourage everybody to go through. If anybody wants me to individually walk you through the changes, I'd be more than happy to. Anybody who wants to see what the bylaw reg review committee did, there are YouTube videos up that painstakingly detail every single line of that document. So anyway, we're ready for a <laughs> comment when you are. <laughs> That's a great overview, Erin. As you're going through that list, I can think of, if not one, probably multiple hearings in which we got like very hung up over one of the issues that you guys have clarified. Like I literally could go through with an example of each of the, a time that one of those con conflicting issues between our bylaw and the Wetland Protection Act has caused an issue on a hearing. So I really appreciate that clarity. Um, the other one was there anything with intermittent and perennial streams that you wanted to? Yes, thank you yeah. for reminding me. Under Riverfront, it's exactly the same as the Wetland Protection Act. 
However, there is one definition that's different. If a if a intermittent stream in the town of Amherst has a watershed greater than a half square mile, it is perennial under the new regulations. I, I think uh, how are you measuring very... that half square mile? <laughs> What'd you say, Fletcher? How are you measuring you... that half square mile? <laughs> very carefully. Yeah, exactly. No, but With that's a good point. Technical expertise. That's an excellent point, though, Fletcher. That's an excellent point, and that may be a good place to add some additional clarity. So I appreciate that. Yeah, like what are the finding of fact, like requirements for for doc, or what are the documentation requirements for the drainage area to that quote unquote intermittent stream? That's Would a great idea. Area. Yeah, you did. You did add something in there, Erin. I can't remember the wording, but we did define professional expertise to a greater extent. So there's like no um, ambiguity there anymore. Competent source was defined. There was a couple additional definitions that were added. Competent source, best management practice, clear cutting was defined, impervious surface was defined. There was a lot of things that were defined and we put a lot of thought and a lot of detail into those definitions to make sure that it was, we tried to make it as crystal clear as possible. Yeah. Um, I, reading that over, I thought, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was, no, go ahead, Jen, I'll follow. I was just gonna say reading that over, I thought, it was an improvement over the current like well and protection act <laughs> guidelines for intermittent versus perennial streams so i'm a fan <laughs> sorry michelle what were you gonna say? i was just gonna say those uh, those commissioners with forestry etc backgrounds if you could review said sections and perhaps um you know specifically look at them um you know, we struggled with them and, and there's a lot of sources to go by, but we appreciate input on those specifically. Yes, I can certainly help you with that. Awesome. Um, I did look over them and I do have a couple um, things. Great. I... So, so I didn't look down. at this forestry specific, but I did look very carefully at that intermittent first and yeah. perennial section. So is there also... more that you wanted to flag in that department, Michelle? Um. I mean, I guess the if everybody could sort of gather their expertise and hone in on particular sections that they'd have some input on. Um, so, so like the forestry one, I think Leroy had some background in that, um, and so we settled on some definitions with Aaron's also research. But um, yeah, just appreciate input on it because we didn't, you know, we had our meetings and then we had our homework, so. It, it's not like a hundred percent. It would I would just appreciate people's expertise on any sections relevant to your knowledge. Gotcha. Thank you, Michelle. And All right. And Go ahead. I could just say one thing. So um, Leroy touched on this, and I forgot to mention it. Is minor grammatical changes were still oh, yeah. cleaning up. Um, and references to sections were still cleaning up because the references to sections um, until we get it agreed upon we don't want to insert all the section references if a certain section yeah. is still going to get swiped out so that's kind of the last change um and then i what i'd like to do is if anybody has proposed changes on the commission send me those changes so that i can do sort of the last final markup before the next hearing at the next hearing i'm hoping it'll be final public comment and approval and i can kind of run through if there's any last minute changes that had not already been um, posted on the commission page. Um, I would detail those kind of what those last minute changes were. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, so let's target another 13 minutes of public comment. Um, we can adjust that if necessary, but I think this is our time to hear from our constituents here. So um, thank you everyone who's hung on for this discussion. I know it can get very detailed. Hopefully we've kind of made it as accessible as possible, um, but we welcome any questions or um, comments relevant to the revision, proposed revisions to the bylaw. Janet, I see you're here again. Allow you to talk. 
So um, I wonder if you can tell me, um, I've looked on uh, the Conservation Commission page um, and uh, what can we expect be, to be posted there um, before the next hearing? Um, it, it's, a, it's a little difficult not being a wetlands expert to look at the fragments and I appreciate that the fragments are there, you know, the, but um, am I missing something? Is there a whole document somewhere that we can look at or um, uh, is Leroy's um, presentation or any of the other presentation materials that you um, showed us, uh, uh, is that stuff available? Um, and if so, how can we get to it? So that, that's my basic question. Thank you. Yeah, so the answer is yes. All of that is available online. Erin, um, what's the best way to direct so, Janet? Yeah, so what I can do is actually post a full full text version of the sort of final clean version. Um, again, it, it's like I want to wait to assemble that until we have comments from anyone, if there are comments from anyone. But if the commission would like for me to assemble that now, I would be happy to, to post it so people can sort of see the document in its entirety, um, sort of a semi-final draft form. Um, and Leroy's presentation, I can definitely post online, but all of the previous presentations and meetings are posted on our YouTube station, which if you go to the Conservation Commission webpage um, in the right hand column at the at the bottom of that the list on the right column there's a link to the all of the YouTube presentations that have um, all of the information from our concom meetings and our subcommittee me subcommittee meetings. Yeah, so Janet, I'm on the website right now. If you just, if you Google Amherst, Massachusetts Conservation Commission, go to our homepage on the right hand side, scroll down, there's a live link that says meeting recordings. That will take you to the YouTube channel with the recordings of all of our meetings. And so that would include Leroy's presentation and discussion in the previous meeting about the bylaws. And then what Aaron's saying is that right now we have Kind of here's the regulation, here's the proposed revision is separate documents. But Erin, once she has the final comments from us, we'll post one collate like collated document on the website. Does that okay. answer the question? Uh yeah, yes. Thank you. And you can always email Erin if you can't find something that we've said would be there because I know it can be hard to find stuff. Right. Thanks a lot. Yep. <clears throat> um, anyone else? Any other questions or comments? James, see James. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hi, I have a few comments. Um, in terms of wavering the um, notification, and I, I um, appreciate your point about, you know, trying to limit the, um, the onus on the applicant, but is it the criteria on how much the um, homeowner has as resources or how much impact that project is going to have on the environment. So if you're trying to make, you know, keep the little guy, protect the little guy, is he little because it's a little, he has little resources or because the project has little impact? Right. Yeah, I see your point. And um, I think that's kind of what Laura and I were talking about when we said there's a lot of information data, frankly, that we don't have, right? So like, not only do we not have the science to understand like the aggregate, the impacts in aggregate on our resources, we also don't have information about the null case, right? Like we don't know how many people aren't submitting RDAs. Um, 
but I think that is a very good point and um, another way to slice kind of the conflict that we see. And another thought, if I can, um, if it's not um, put out there, if there, if there is no notification, then the, the onus is on us in the community to kind of go digging for it. And uh, Fletcher made the comment that it's all on the website. When do I go look on the website? Should I just be doing it every day because maybe something comes up that might impact me or something I care about? Would it be possible to have a, um, a targeted mailing list or mailing lists that we could opt into? So if it's impacting my neighborhood, I would get notified. If it's going to, you know, something I'm concerned about, it's use of herbicides or if it's a wetland issue. So then I would automatically be notified anything is on your agenda without it being the responsibility of the, the person applying. Just as another way of trying to, you know, get the community involvement because I don't subscribe to the Gazette. And so therefore, how else am I gonna know when there's something that, hey, heads up, this, this impacts me. Because I'm not on the board. And by the way, I really do appreciate what you guys do. Oh my God. <laughs> It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. No, those are great. Those are great points, James. I don't know how like opting into notification interse intersects with like very strict of butter notification regulations. So that's probably something that we have to think about. Um, but thank you for that. It could be an addition to the a butter notification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Move on here. Um, Sarah. Oh, wrong, wrong person. Sorry, hold on. Uh, okay. Sarah, I see you have your hands up again. Hi, thanks. Hello. Yeah, I just am um, weighing in again. I just, um, again, thank you so much, Aaron, for all your work. And I just want to emphasize, you know, that what she said about the, the, the her proposal and the work that was done wasn't to remove the butter notification completely. That was never the intent. And um, I also just wanted to emphasize again, I mean, I can't help it, I'm a lawyer, but I think people have a little difficulty understanding the importance, the legal significance of that request for determination of applicability. Sometimes, you know, in the random, you know, in the sort of day-to-day -day case, it maybe doesn't matter. But in some of the more complicated cases and some of the more um, impactful cases, it really does because the request for determination of applicability, as you guys know, you're determining is what is gonna be done going to impact the resource. And if it's gonna impact the resource, then a permit has to be issued. If there's a determination that it's not gonna impact the resource, then there's no need to submit a permit. And that can be the most crucial question if you're talking about something like pesticide application, is it gonna impact the resource is like the most critical question, you know, whether they have to go through the process of submitting it. So, sorry, I'm just pitching again to keep things as they are. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I appreciate the, the extra research and kind of well-informed. Um, Get on the waiting list to be on the concom, Sarah. I know. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Anyone else have any questions or comments? There's still a fair amount of people in the meeting. Please comment, people. <laughs> Raise your hand, I know. Even if you just say, it's good, <laughs> share yeah. your comments, even if, you know, anything is, is uh, helpful for us to hear from you. Oh, Christy, we got that one. Hi, Christy. Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute. Um, well, I, don't, I just have a really short comment. I just want to say how much I appreciate the work that you're doing on clarifying the wetland rules. Um, and I think that the, a lot of the rules are a lot more clear and are, will have an effect that you want to, to make the, the least impactful things um, not necessarily need permitting and the more impactful things um, requiring, you know, more, um, 
more, I guess, um, presentation and consideration. Um, and especially the um, better definition of the perennial streams is much appreciated. Thank you, Christy. Wow, I'm so happy to hear people are listening. I know. <laughs> it's like, it's it's so nice just to hear that like people are interested because like a lot of times when, when you go through this process, no one shows up. And so it's just really encouraging to know that people care and they're hearing this and taking it in and understanding exactly what we're what what our aim is here so. yeah hey, you could thank uh COVID for that i mean because of the zoom honestly we're getting so <laughs> I know. much more we're getting so I much know. more partic uh, participation it is it's remarkable it's a lot easier yeah just a lot easier like sitting on the couch and participate it's amazing uh-huh 100 percent with you on that fletcher on every level <laughs> mm -hmm. it's also nice to show that we just don't take this lightly i mean it's really a lot <laughs> These are not easy decisions. Okay, Kathleen. Hi, I, I just, since getting some feedback is helpful, I just want to say I'm so impressed with this commission and the work people do. And Aaron, you're, you are amazing. The, the professional, the professionalism of this whole committee is something all of Amherst can be proud of and protecting the wetlands, protecting our natural resources is so important for the future of the town. And thank you, thank you for volunteering to be among the people who are doing so much work. Thanks, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Kathleen. See, I actually get paid, so I'm like the lucky one. These guys are all volunteers. They're not getting paid. So I'm the lucky one who gets paid to do this work. Um, so these guys are really the ones you should thank. But thank you for your comments. Thanks, Kathleen. Sorry about my barking dog. Um, anyone else? Questions, comments on the bylaw revisions? So I think I'm going to call it. Um, so it sounds like any final revisions we need to get to Erin ASAP so that she can get one coherent document up on the website. Um, we will hopefully vote on this, these bylaw revisions at the next meeting, which is on June, God, 22nd. June 22nd. Um, so if you're here, and you're interested to see the vote, then that happens on June 22nd. If you wanna see what the final document looks like, it will be posted as soon as we can before June 22nd. Unfortunately, you just gonna have to check the website for that one. Um, but if you wanna see previous recorded meetings and discussions of either the subcommittee or the entire commission on these bylaw regulation, they're on our YouTube channel, which you can find by Googling Amherst Massachusetts Conservation Commission YouTube or going to our website, scrolling down on the bottom to the bottom of the right hand side and clicking on meeting recordings. Um, and if you really can't find it, email Erin um, and she can put you in the right direction. Michelle, did you have another clarifying point or question? Um, actually, it was a question. Just one more thing to leave commissioners with and the public. There, there is one sort of unsettled piece that I don't think that we got a good um, I don't know, I don't even know where to go with it. But so in the vernal pool section, there is the question of how to identify or sort of not necessarily certify, but identify a vernal pool outside of the spring season. And so it's relevant because a lot of activity happens perhaps in the summer or the fall um, when the biological indicators of a vernal pool aren't present. So there are some ways to do that, like the exoskeletons of certain, um, you know, animals that would live in a vernal pool, but in a dry year, they may not be there. So if anybody feels like taking a deep dive into that particular criteria, it's, it's kind of important. I mean, the alternative is that we require an applicant to wait until the spring season when the biological indicators would be there so that we could see it, which, you know, that could be like a nine month waiting period. Um, so we, I don't think that we came to like a great consensus as a subcommittee on what to do about that. So if you have thoughts, just, you know, we'd appreciate weighing in or I don't know, any expert opinions that you might be able to solicit in the meantime. And we did get 
feedback from Emily Stockman, who's our peer okay. reviewer on that. And I incorporated her recommended revisions in there as far as um, I believe it's um, beginning. I don't I don't have it memorized, but I believe it's it's March to June is the window. Um, okay. And so if it's not if it's outside of that window for a vernal pool, then the commission really would have to hold up the proceeding until it's vernal pool season. Okay, so we have to recognize that that's that's in there and we would be doing that. It's the definition of a vernal pool. I mean, that's the tricky part. Right. It's only there. Okay, that's all. Yeah, no, that's great. And we've had tons of hearings, Michelle, where we've waited years, so. Okay, all right, I haven't experienced that yet, but um, yeah, we spent a lot of time on it, so I just wanted to yeah. give you the heads up. Thank you for the close consideration. Um, all right, so we you know, need a motion. You know, on, the web, on the web, there's, if you look it up, there's a slideshow on identifying potential vertical pools in late summer, fall, and winter. Hmm. What's the citation on that? I just put in, uh, 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 identifying potential vernal pools in summer, fall, and winter, and 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 anyway, <laughs> it came up and gave me a, a slideshow. It's I, it's completely it's it may not be anywhere near enough in detail, but it's there anyway. Talking about the different seasons, etc. Yeah, our last vice chair, Bob Brooks, was the vernal pool. I know. It's I wonder if was Bob. The man. Would, yeah, I wonder if Bob would have. I saw him the other day. I wonder Did if he was still around. Oh. Yeah. I moved to Greenfield or something like he always threatened to do. Oh, well, maybe he did. I don't know. He lives here, I but I did see him <laughs> at first. Um, so maybe Bob would be a person to reach out to if we think we need more. I'll, I'll take a look at this section and see what Emily's revisions were. Um, and I could reach out to Bob if we need more detail. Yeah, I think it's pretty solid, but all comment is welcome so please do so and if if people could get me if you have any markups if you could get them to me by the 15th so june 15th um that would be greatly appreciated so i can incorporate the changes and get them posted before the 22nd got it <laughs> all right we need a motion to continue this public hearing make a motion um, i'll make a motion to continue the public hearing of the Amherst bylaw regulation amendments to June 22nd at 7.30. Second that. The second from Andre. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Barry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. I think that was it. Um, I don't check. We got all the business, right? Do, do, do. Yep. We talked about that. Talked about that. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like our, here are our deadlines June 15th for any revisions to Erin so that mm -hmm. she can post them before the 22nd. Our next meeting is on the 22nd. Make sure you hydrate, caffeinate, <laughs> eat a good meal. No, but not too much that so you're tired. Um, for real. <laughs> <laughs> um and then june 22nd 29th we'll have a special 29th. meeting okay. so that just remember that so that we can talk about land use policy and the zero tuckerman um proposed restoration plan which is exciting and then our next meeting after that isn't until july 13th so that's the forecast Great. any final questions or comments No, but I think you need a motion to close the meeting. We do. Are you which on am, it, Laura? Which I am so happy to make. Thank you. No What's second. Oh, I'll second. second. Okay, we got Fletcher in the second, Aaron. Voice vote, Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you guys so much. You're Great. all Good job, awesome. Everyone. Your comments yeah. are stellar. I appreciate oh. you guys. <laughs>
Likewise, right back at your faces.